my influences, and my father was a singer, although he was also a school principal. Um, that was really the biggest music in my family, so I would play for my father since I was a little kid. Started playing classical music four years old. But I'd never really heard soul music or like really um, intense gospel music. My church was more um, Anglican Protestant. But my grandparents, both of my parents were from uh, New Orleans area, Louisiana. So I would go down there for Christmas, Easter, that kind of thing, maybe twice a year. That absolutely influenced my music because I, I, I could feel that music in my soul and I could tell that it, there was something very special about it. So I think that like, I, I'm actually, I'm a, a mixture of the classical and the gospel kind of put together. I was about 14 and I went to an Earth, Wind & Fire concert. I totally remember the moment, I can almost remember the second, um, watching Earth, Wind & Fire. First of all, it was just mind blowing because it was just this band sound that was just amazing with a horn section and um, incredible songs that I'd never heard before and magic. They had people disappearing and the bass player Verdine was levitating in the air and all this kind of stuff. I just never experienced a thing like that. And I remember the last song they did was That's the Way of the World, which is, you know, now I know they call it their national anthem. And I understand why, because it just there's just something about it where um, it's almost like angelic in a way, the way that they're singing, you know, and you can tell that it's, it comes from a gospel tradition, but it's this just kind of like release of the soul kind of thing. And I remember almost like the, the lightning bolt and the light saying, this is what you want to do with your life, you know, you want to play this kind of music and you want to, uh, the bass player I was intrigued with, um, Verdine White, who's now a friend. Um, you know, so I was just kind of like, wow, this is what I'm going to do. And that altered my, the course of my life to head towards that kind of music and ultimately to get in the band, Earth, Wind & Fire. But what I did was, you know, after that concert, I really started starting my own bands. You know, like I started um, actually even writing my own music. Um, I started arranging horns and that kind of stuff and, you know, learning how to write it on paper. Um, Okay, you play that note, you play that note, this and that, and the rhythms and how to write them out. Um, and then, you know, I just just kind of started my own Earth, Wind & Fire, and I, all through high school, we were starting to get even work as a band. We were playing, you know, dances and stuff like that, even in high school. So I went from high school into college, um, into university, and um, my parents very much wanted me to have a career that I could really depend on and didn't feel that music was it. So I started college as an engineer, but I was actually still playing in bands and stuff. So I, uh, as, as an engineer, you have to really put a lot of time into your studies. But I was going, getting in a car and driving out to some gig, playing it, coming back two, three in the morning, going to class at eight in the morning, you know, this kind of thing. And of course that didn't last long. Um, and, I, and I ended up going into music and getting a, a degree in music. And almost directly out of that, I went into uh, going on the road with Ray Charles, directly out of, out of college. Um, I tell the story of how I, uh, Ray Charles was playing at our university, and I um, went backstage and met some of the uh, band members, and one of them was a the music director. And he had me, um, I asked him, how do you get into getting in a professional thing like this? And he says, um, well, you know, they, they need a bass player for the next tour anyway, so send a tape to this address. So I, I made a demo tape at the studio and sent it in, and, um, and they called me, you know. So that was the beginning of the 35 years of touring that I've done so far. I don't practice half as much as I want to. If I do something that requires a lot of dexterity, um, let's say I'm playing Rhapsody in Blue with orchestra or something, which I still do from time to time, um, I will practice intensely for that amount of time. Um, or if I have a gig that, that requires a lot of study, um, maybe it's maybe some, something that's like jazz oriented or you know, needs, needs a little bit more than your average you know, pop gig or something, then I'll practice. But in general, I don't get to practice as much as I want, especially on the trumpet, which I still play. Um, the trumpet requires a lot of practice because it's muscle control, you know, your lips and embouchure. Um, so that's the one that, that, I, that hurts me the most because I, um, you know, without practicing, after about three days, you're kind of starting over again. Um, but as far as bass and the keyboards, um, I can pretty much pick them up and, just, and start playing, you know. 
when you set your career to be a musician, there's so much other things that go with it. Uh, all the admin stuff that goes with it and all the business, you know, I've kind of ventured out into some businesses, including, you know, making apps and uh, doing a lot of teaching and doing a lot of, um, you know, just like um, entrepreneurial type things. I had a record label for a while, um, a lot of charity work and all that. So there's that amount of time that I need for that as well, you know, just sitting there doing business things, you know, so um, it's harder to, to get practice time than it used to be. Um, when I did my first um, venture into like the writing um, publishing game was with a guy named Najee, and that was um, smooth jazz type stuff. And he just asked me to write with him, you know, and we just kept, I would go to his house and we'd write. And then we recorded and we put his album out and the album went gold. So we had sold over 500,000 copies. So like all of a sudden checks were showing up in my house and then I never really experienced that before, like getting uh, what we call mailbox money. And um, then some of the songs were like actually put into movie. Um, and then the same thing happened with Earth, Wind & Fire. I was brought into the writing process with Earth, Wind & Fire, and on one album I wrote about five or six, of, co-wrote five or six of the songs, and one of the songs was brought into a Spike Lee movie, so then there wasn't th that extra thing as well. So you never know um, what's gonna happen with your songs, ever. I mean, like, just because something was um, 20, 30 years old, it might still come back again in some movie, you know? Um, as we, as you see all the time in remakes and remixes and all that kind of stuff. So it's a very, uh, it's a very lucrative game to get into if you know how to play it. But there's been, the thing to me that I love is when I get recognized for the actual material itself and somebody tells me, you know, I love that song that you wrote and you realize that it's a song that you really did write. The role of music director uh, is different from artist to artist, and there are but there are some things that are that are similar, you know, in all situations. Like um, I think, um, as a music director, my first job is to make sure that the artist is happy with what's going on, giving them their best music, making them feel confident on stage, making them feel like they have a show that they're really, really proud of. So I'm part of I'm always a part of like kind of the um, putting together the show. You know, now with Earth, Wind & Fire, uh, we're talking about um, a situation where there's more than one person that's the artist, it's actually a band. So, of course, innately, that's gonna mean that there's differences of opinion. I'm gonna get one, one person tell me one thing and somebody else saying something else. Um, at the same time, you've also got choreography um, and that, so that always has to be considered as well as like all the other production angles. Um, so it was great, I actually, with Earth, Wind & Fire, I, Philip Bailey was pretty much the one that I worked with the most in terms of putting the show together. And you're talking about a band that at the time that had been together for like about 30 years when I got in it. So they're always looking for kind of new ways to do the songs, new ways to tie them together, um, material that connects song to song. I work with Bette Midler now, and Bette, um, as her musical director, she has a very eclectic show. So one song is like a funk song, the next one, vaudeville you know telling jokes one after that disney you know this kind of thing next one's a rock and roll song remake of beast of burden uh, which she made famous with with uh, mick jagger so i really enjoyed that because it was um all the production that went with it all the choreography that went with it it was almost as if you were going kind of through a um, bit of a time warp or you know like a variety show um and i really enjoyed that because uh, we had to do a lot of different styles um, but then, you know, a lot of times music directing, direction has to do with the actual artist and like playing for them as well. So I did play a lot of piano for Bet. Um, and I think a lot of times those artists, they want to feel supported in that way as like you're their accompanist, but you also give them fresh ideas to where they can go other places that they normally wouldn't. The Michael Jackson show was certainly pr the largest production I've been a part of. Yeah, in that respect, as far as uh, you know, what we call the uh, all the um, the bells and whistles, and you know all the production the production things, and how many things had to go right for it to to come off. There was a huge video screen, the biggest. I think it was. I think it set records of how big it was, and there were certainly some gags, as we call them, that I didn't get to see. Um, I, there, there's some parts of it that never just we never got to. Um, I think now it's not really a secret uh, about it anymore, but um, 
he was going to, I think he was going to leave the, um, the show in an airplane, you know. Yeah, it was hard. I mean, it was, first of all, it was emotionally hard, of course. Um, we were all very, very excited about doing the show. We were ready, prepared for the show. We felt we had, like, the best show out there. Um, from everything I could see, Michael seemed to be like he was, you know, very up for doing it. When, the, when it all happened, uh, it, it set us into a, a lot of problems. First of all, it was the beginning of the summer, it was June, and that is when you get hired for tours. So since we didn't have any work, we were, you know, it wasn't, there weren't tours that were going out, you know, and we were kind of left. Um, and no, we weren't compensated at all, you know. Um, we were literally uh, let go from that day with no compensation. And um, then, the, you know, as we know now, a movie came out called This Is It, which was made up of our, um, all of our, you know, uh, rehearsal video that was, we were told was for Michael so that he could critique it and, you know, make adjustments and such. And then it comes out as a $600 million movie. And no, we weren't compensated at all for that. No. Nope. So that was disheartening, I have to say. You know? But, uh, yeah, but, you know, then you pick up and you're like, okay, what am I going to do next? You know, and I, I was, uh, it was kind of like double heartbreak because then I was given a chance to do Christina Aguilera tour. And we rehearsed and we did, um, we did a lot of television promoting the tour and her new album. Um, her, her new album home didn't do as well as some of her others, and they canceled the tour. So it was two canceled tours in a row, you know. So mo most of my ambitions really at this part of my life have to do with um, more like business level things. I certainly want to do music, but I kind of want to have my own stuff. And then I still dream about, you know, my band playing festivals, you know, I still am doing my own music. Uh, and I'm my wife, uh, Kedma, who's an incredible singer, you know, um, has her own ambitions as well. And I'm usually part of that, you know. Um, so uh, it's, it's more like that kind of stuff. I'm really into uh, doing our own thing and owning our own thing. Mm -hmm.